This episode contains discussions including explicit language, emotional eating, diet culture, workplace harassment, PTSD, anxiety, depression, and mention of suicidal thoughts, spiritual themes, and narcissistic abuse. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Body Story Podcast, a show about the way we're navigating the world and the bodies we've been given. I'm your host, Tiffany Eller, and I believe that if one person's story can change the way you look at them, a collection of stories may be able to change the world. Today, I'll be speaking with Lila Jones, aka Mermaid Lila, a marine biologist, professional mermaid, creator and program coordinator for the National Association of Underwater Instruction's Mermaid Program, and owner of Mermaid Dream Retreats. Let's get into the episode. Hi, Lila. How are you today? Good morning. I'm fabulous. How are you? So good. I'm so ecstatic to be talking to a real life mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't wait to hear about it. Um, so you're in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you're a professional I, mermaid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the life. <laughs> it sounds like the life. So where would you like to start in your body story today? You know, I've been giving that a lot of thought, and I it always helps to start from the beginning. Um, and so, for me, for for my body journey, it's it's actually been really kind of up and down. And you know, I at a very young age, I started using food as a way to cope with emotional stress. Um, and so, I had a lot of people, you know, very close influencers, family members and things like that, who saw me go through this weight gain at a very young age and didn't know how to necessarily handle it. (laughs) Um, So I had some family members that were like, you need to go on a diet. Are you sure you want to eat that? Saying all these things. And then, you know, I had mom being mama bear who was like, shut the fuck up. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah yeah well because the other the other side of it too is always took I I take after my dad's side of the family and they're a bigger heftier group of people Um, whereas my mom's side of the family which is who I grew up around um, they tend to be much more thin (laughs) and so like growing up I had this very skewed image of my body and what was beautiful and I remember you know, crying to my mom, like, why am I fat? And it's like, it it created this sort of shame around my body, just being what it was. And so like, the emotional eating was something that I I had to learn about. And I didn't start learning about it until recently. (laughs) Um, So it's, it's just been interesting how the those little digs when you're young, sort of influence everything around you it influences your relationship with people your self-confidence your self-worth and it wasn't until I actually started going to counseling to deal with a bunch of other stuff that I was really able to start looking at this and saying you know what those people's beliefs they're, they're not mine like I don't believe that I'm overweight I don't believe that I'm unhealthy um and just those types of breakthroughs that I've had going through that process with someone to help guide me has been incredible. So that's been really, yeah, it's been pretty amazing. And when I started pursuing mermaiding, um, it was after I had, I was working in Alaska on commercial fishing boats and my job was to get fisheries management data for NOAA. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was a really fun job and you know there were some things that happened that ended up traumatizing me I was on a, a boat where I was getting harassed and you know that sort of threw me for a loop so after I was after my contract was done on that boat I was like I'm done like I'm not coming back here <laughs> at least not doing this job. Peace out. (laughs) Good for you. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting because for the position that I I had on the commercial fishing boats, um, I was 
considered a federal worker. And so harassment of a federal employee is like a $10,000 fine and, you know, potentially jail time. And NOAA has an entire office of law enforcement to like pursue and kind of say like, Hey, you guys fucked up. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So so, did you pursue that then? Well, the, the nice thing is I didn't have to like go to court or anything. Um, Everything that happened, I I wrote down in my daily log. And so instead of having me come in and relive that, they just submitted my daily log as testimony. Oh, good. Yeah. So that was pretty interesting. And I I remember when I was pulled off that boat, it was like, and I ended up back in Dutch Harbor. (laughs) I was pulled into the NOAA office. And they're just like, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm good. I really would rather be home, but I'm good. I'm fine. And so it, like, it, it's this weird switch that happens when you go through something traumatic where you go into survival mode. And I was in that survival mode. And I swear, I know where this is going. It seems like a tangent, but I know where this is going. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, this is your body story. There are no tangents. Yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah so like I was in survival mode and like I'm completely fine everything is hunky dory like <laughs> life is wonderful I go home in a week <laughs> um and they said okay well you know we wanted to give you some resources and you know they gave me like phone numbers to call for you know harassment and and this and that they were just kind of like helplines and I was like, why would I need this? This is completely useless to me. And and then he said very seriously, he's, he looked me dead in the eye and said, if you have a complete mental breakdown two months from now, that is completely normal. That's PTSD. We would advise that you get help. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, two months later, I was home. And I woke up screaming. (laughs) I, yeah, I had a dream that I was stuck on that boat and I couldn't find my way out. And that feeling of being trapped, like, was a complete trigger. Um, Because on the, on that particular boat, it was just me as the federal observer. I was by myself. I was away from my friends. We were going to different ports. We weren't coming back to Dutch Harbor, which is where all my friends were. Um, So I had to really, like, deal with all of that on my own. Um, and instead of getting help with it, I, I internalized it. <laughs> so cue, <laughs> cue poor uh, coping mechanisms with food. <laughs> um, and so I, yeah, that, that was shortly before I moved to Maui um, to, to open up Mermaid Dream Retreats and be, start my journey as a professional mermaid was that um so was that incident and working in that environment the thing that made you reconsider where your career was going so there's a couple of things that made me reconsider where my career was going both happened in Alaska (laughs) that was one of them um the other one was my very first contract up in Alaska fresh observer straight off the plane um I ended up on a boat with a captain who I'm still very good friends with. And I had a full on like spiritual experience. And I'm talking like, (laughs) like when I tell this story, I know that it happened, but I still don't quite believe it. (laughs) I'm interested. Um, Yeah. So basically what happened and you know i'm not saying this to push any type of spiritual views on people this is just my experience um i end up on this boat and for me like one of the big draws of being able to work in alaska is being around the whales that was like my jam i love killer whales i love humpback whales i love dolphins like cetaceans are my babies <laughs> and so I was like I might see killer whales and I am so excited about that so I get on this boat and I tell this captain hey if we see killer whales even if I'm sleeping just wake my ass up like it's fine I won't be mad because it's killer whales he's like <laughs> okay yeah 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 cool um and so like one day the mate comes down and he goes, Oh, Hey, there's, there's two killer whales up here. And I'm like, cool. Awesome. And I, I go and I, I'm looking at them through the binoculars and it's a male and female 
whale traveling together. And I just had this complete revelation. And this is just the beginning of this story, but the revelation was that I am exactly where I need to be and I have my teacher. And I was like, oh, that's weird. I'm like, whatever. And then <laughs> I, I like turned to the caption. I was like, is it weird that when I see killer whales, I feel like I get messages? And like without missing a beat, this guy just like looks up from the book he's reading and goes, I've heard weirder and just goes back to reading. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, I'm like, okay, awesome. That's, you know, that's good. Um, and so like the day, you know, the days go on and this and that. And then one day the captain is talking about his daughter who is a medium. So she, she actually can talk to dead people uh, and she's very good at it. <laughs> and so like, this is something I've always been kind of curious about. Cause like the, the jury was out for me as far as whether or not this was possible as a scientist. So I sit in on the conversation and right when I sit down at the galley table to listen in, he just looks at me and goes, so what's happened to you? And I just was like, nothing, you know, I'm just curious. And he's like, no, people don't just sit in on these conversations. (laughs) And I was like, well, I mean, I've had weird dreams and, you know, they kind of scare me because I hear like this high pitched dream. I'm in whatever room that I'm sleeping in. And if I look at the clock, like it's the time I'm going to wake up and it scares the shit out of me. And he just started laughing. He's like, oh, that's hilarious. You're a medium too. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> you're just a crazy sea captain. And, um, so he's like, what color is my aura? And I was like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> but in my, but here's the weird part is in my head, I'm like, it's gray. And he's like, I'll give you a hint. Cause Stephanie told me earlier, his daughter's, she told me earlier, it's uh, it's gray. He's like, okay, well that was weird. <laughs> and I didn't, I, I'm just like, all right, well, well, you know, coincidence, coincidence. And then the, the mate walks by and he goes, what color is his aura? And I was just heard in my head, like, it's it's dark. It's like charcoal color. It's like black. <laughs> and I just kind of like looked at, at the captain. And at this point, I'm like, I think I'm going crazy. Um, and he's like, I'll give you a hint. It's really, really dark. And I was like, it's it's black. And he goes, yeah. And he's like, I bet, I bet if you tune into it, you'll, you know, you'll figure out why. And. All I heard in my head was like, what did she do to you? And I was just like, okay, you know, this is getting too strange. (laughs) Was the aura reading and hearing things or having the dreams, did that happen after you saw the whales? Or what had that been happening your whole life? The dreams had been happening for a long time. So, you know, little things like deja vu, um, you know, just kind of that, that sense of knowing, that intuition has always sort of been there. But I always kind of suppressed it because those dreams started when I was around a teenage age. So like 13, 14 years old. Um, And it usually came with sleep paralysis. So it scared me. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, And so I just would ignore it. Um, And then as I got older, the dreams got more intense and more vivid. And I started moving or, you know, feeling pulled in one direction or the other. And, it, you know, that's still very scary. (laughs) Um, so now I'm finally sitting here and there's this sea captain telling me like, oh no, I know exactly what that is. And I'm going to teach you how to not be afraid of it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> cool. yeah. And so it's like, sure. Um, and you know, he ended up that later that day, he wrote down two names on a piece of paper and he handed me the paper and said, write down everything that comes to mind about these people. And these are people I have, I don't know. They're his family. And I'm just like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> so I just start writing. And then, you know, at one point, my one of my friends came on the boat. We start talking and giggling and I'm still writing. And, you know, we start joking around and everything. And by the time they left, you know, the captain's like, so let me see that paper. And I handed it to him and he's like looking over it. And he looks at me and he looks back down. And he points to a certain section in the second name. He's like, this is where your friend came on board. And he's like, yeah, it was around that part. How'd you know? He's like, because everything after that is wrong. Everything before that is right. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And that's when I was like, the fuck? <laughs> Whoa. Because I, cool... 
<laughs> that, yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I just felt like I was pulling stuff out of my ass. Like, I didn't know that it was actually, like, true. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and you know, I, I ended up having, like, an overnight shift, and, and I ended up going up to the uh, the wheelhouse when I was done, and the captain just kind of looked at me, and then he was like, why the fuck are you awake right now? <laughs> And I was like, we're going to see a whale that I've never seen before. And I want to make sure that I don't miss it. And he's like, okay, sure, whatever. And we get to talking about this stuff and spirituality and, you know, why people are afraid of it, why they shouldn't be afraid of it. Uh, And right behind him, there's a sperm whale. (laughs) Whoa. And I was like, oh, there's a sperm whale over there. And he's like, have you ever seen one before? And I was like, no. (laughs) No. Um, but you can tell cause when a sperm whale, it, it, their blowhole is like on the curve of their head. So they, their puff is at like a 45 degree angle. And I was like, Oh my God, this is awesome. I've never seen a sperm whale before. This is cool. And that's when Acasio, the captain put together that whales and me have a very strange field connection. <laughs> so. I love that. Yeah, so that's that's what when you know he decided he was going to do an experiment with me, and I was like, "Cool!" And the scientist experiments are awesome, and he's like, "But it's it's for your intuition, not for like science y type stuff." And I'm like, "All right." <laughs> and he yeah. showed me, yeah, so, it was because you're a marine <laughs> biologist, so you are a scientist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's like, it's not it's not for, like, biology. <laughs> <laughs> it was strictly for his own amusement, and it ended up being life-changing because what he did was he showed me a video of killer whales that had followed that specific boat. And for me and, and killer whales, it's like I get complete tunnel vision. There is nothing else going on around me. I don't hear anything. It's just like, that is a killer whale, and it is beautiful, and I love it, and everything is right in the world. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> and yeah, and so after this video, he's like, I'm going to show you pictures of people and you tell me everything about them. And I'm like, okay. And at first it felt very basic, like, oh, this person's happy, but they want a little bit more out of life. But at this moment, they're content. There's this might be kind of like a yellowish color around them, which is contentment and blah, 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 blah. blah. And this just felt like very basic things to me. It didn't feel like it was impressive. It didn't feel like anything, you know, extraordinary. And then, you know, the pictures get more complicated. And at one point, there was a picture of three women. They were all older. And I was like, couldn't figure out what was going on in in the photo. And I was like, well, Acasio knows these people. I can just like read his energy if this stuff's real. (laughs) Yeah. And at that point he like at the the second after I thought that he pulled away from me because he's like <laughs> leaning leaning on the desk and he like kind of like perked up and he's like oh that was weird and I was like what happened he's like I felt this pressure under my eye and I was like well that that part of my nose is stuffed up right now <laughs> Whoa. yeah so it just got crazy and he's like you you can't you can't use me for the answers <laughs> <laughs> and I was like shit <laughs> Um, and so I remember like after that point, I just started, I felt my heart like beat funny. And so I asked, does this person in the picture have a pacemaker? And he goes, yes. And at that point I was spilling the guts about the relationship dynamic of these three women and this and that, and like all these crazy specific details of these women's lives. And I remember telling him, because he asked, you know, is that we know they're old, we know they're getting close to their time to pass on. Why is is this woman, and he very was very specific, why is this woman and why hasn't she passed on yet? And I was like, Well, she's waiting for the kids to be okay. And he's like, She doesn't have any kids. And I was like, Well, I know I'm right. (laughs) (laughs) Right now I know that I'm right. And I said, No, there's there's two generations of women and they might not be her biological kids, but she sees them as her children and she's waiting for them to be okay. And he's like, yeah, do you know who they are? And I said, it's your wife and daughter. And he was like, you're right. And I was like, cool. (laughs) 
And it just got very strange after that. Um, at one point, he was asking me about one of his friends who was in the hospital, and my vision split like I was playing a two-player video game. What? And Yeah, it was crazy. So it was like the player one was like in the hospital room. Player two was still on this boat in Alaska in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And then, like, I'm telling him all these details. And at one point, when when it was time to finish, like, he just grabbed my hands and says, okay, Lila, I need you to come back now. And I just remember looking at him and looking around and everything just seemed really, really bright. And, you know, I've never done mind-altering drugs before, but I figure if I was going to do mind-altering drugs, that's what it would be like. <laughs> <laughs> like, everything was glowing. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, it is such a beautiful day. Look at how clear the water is. Do you look at these sea stars? Oh my gosh, Acosta, you're like glowing. <laughs> <laughs> it was nuts. He's like, you haven't slept in like 24 hours. <laughs> Wait, you've just you, gone were through you guys this. in that session for 24 hours? No, no. Oh. It, was, it was just, I hadn't gone to bed because I had to work that overnight shift. And then I went uh. up to the, yeah. So he's like, you've been up for a very long time. You should probably sleep. And I was like, cool. Yeah, sleep. Sleep sounds good. Sleep sounds wonderful right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. And like, I was, I remember just laying in my bunk and it sounded like somebody left a radio on. There was just this chatter. And it was very strange because I remember hearing that kind of chatter as a young kid. And at one point, I was like, guys, I need you to shut up because I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and like that, that was just the craziest thing. Like I haven't had anything that intense happen ever again. Wow. But that's what got me exploring my spirituality more. And that's really where I started rebuilding my relationship with myself was after that trip. Um, and you know, they started calling me Whale Whisperer on that boat. Um, I ended up getting that nickname on a couple other boats, too. Because <laughs> uh, it would be, like, I would just be sitting there and I'd be like, we're going to see whales today, guys. We're going to see dolls' porpoises at about 4 p.m. And then, sure enough, at 4 p.m., the dolls' porpoises are showing up. Are you serious? Like, yeah, it was weird. And I, I don't know if it's because I was so isolated and there was no internet. You know, <laughs> could be. But I was just like, I was like, you know, I it was it was very zen. Like I am one with the ocean, and the ocean is me. And at one point, I remember like thinking to myself, um, "God, you know, if you want me to leave marine biology and use these gifts to to help out with whatever my purpose is, you know, I'd gladly do that." And I felt the entire universe laugh in my face. Like, <laughs> you're joking, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, you wanted to be a marine biologist since you were five. You've been fascinated with the ocean literally your entire life, and you just are saying you're going to walk away from that? <laughs> it was like, well, no. <laughs> like, there's a reason why you have that passion. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I went through a lot of um courses and things like that to kind of learn about this aspect of my identity more and that's when i learned that mermaids were a thing <laughs> and it was like oh i was like i can use mermaids as a way to teach people about the ocean and give them this experience and hold this space for them to be playful and whimsical and sort of incorporate this this fantasy aspect of life into this real world and then give them the tools they need to go out and, you know, help the oceans in their own way. And so I was like, I'm totally on board for this. <laughs> <laughs> so was was that realization of using mermaids when you had the realization that you could be a mermaid yeah yeah <laughs> like at that point I was I, I was actually in Maui at a um at doing a course for like you know in, intuitive development and I was like I know I'm moving back to Hawaii 
I wonder which island it is. <laughs> and someone's like, oh, you're moving here and you're, uh, you're opening a mermaid school. And I was like, oh, actually, that sounds 100% correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And, yeah. Yeah. And so, so I moved to Maui in March of 2015. I, I came back to the state. I did my, my college degree out here. Um, and that's when I really started, you know, oh, I'm putting on a mermaid tail. I'm going to go swimming. And I, you know, oh, the humpback whales are singing underwater and you can hear it. And well, I'm going to practice my, my free diving. And so it's, it's been really cool because it's been a very short amount of time. But in that time, the amount of growth with my, you know, profession and with myself and rebuilding those, that relationship, the mermaiding is really what kicked it off. Because, you know, it, it, being a performer, you have to be in tune with your body and what your body is doing. You have to know how to communicate that to other people when I'm teaching them. And, you know, it's, it's almost like it puts you in touch with this sense of grace. And I, you know, it, it's a very specific, I call it fluid movement, <laughs> where you know, everything is just kind of flowy <laughs> and it's, it takes a lot of refinement as a performer to be able to do that well. Yeah, I'd imagine. Yeah. So it, it's been crazy to know that I just started as some kid swimming on the reefs out here. And, you know, now I'm like, no, I've, I've literally written the book on how to be a mermaid diver. <laughs> yeah, you you literally have written a book, right? I, you... I have, yeah, I've written a literal book, and that's more about the spirituality and how mermaiding helped with the PTSD and depression um, from my time in Alaska, and also sort of like embracing this aspect of myself that, that is very take no shit. And can you yeah. can you tell me a little bit more about that? Is the take no shit because of like what does that do to like do you get a lot of shit for being a mermaid? So it's not so much that I get shit for being a mermaid, <laughs> although that has happened, and I just kind of shrug it off, just like, well, sucks for you. I get paid to do this. I get paid well, <laughs> and I love it. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, but the take the take no shit. There's there's um. There's a story there, <laughs> and I don't want to get too far into it because I don't want to, you know, give a bad rap to my beginnings. Um, but I had collaborated with someone for a few years who ended up being uh, narcissistically abusive, <laughs> and you know that had been a trend in my life, especially with, with guys in my life is that, you know, I attract this narcissistic abuse. Um, and so it's kind of like, you know, my, my take no shit. I ended up leaving that business relationship back in June. And in the past seven months, um, my, my company, everything has just sort of taken off on its own. Um, and it's been one of those things where, you know, I had to really step up for myself and defend myself and be the protector for myself and just say, you know what, this is unacceptable <laughs> and I don't have to take it. Um, and, you know, part of it too is there was a lot of fear. I didn't think that I could do this stuff by myself. You know, I was independently contracted by this person and, you know, I, I felt like I had poured my soul into what they were creating. And I really wanted it to be successful because I knew that it would mean that I would be successful too. And this was a collaborative effort and it quickly switched <laughs> from being a, a collaborative effort to being a one-sided, you know, exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's a common thing for girls and women to go through. Um, and, you know, especially, there's there's a whole bunch of socio political stuff that we can get into with that because <laughs> um, I know it's not just girls and women but it's um, it's something that that had been a trend for a very long time and you know I hit my point where I decided 2019 is the year that I'm leaving that shit behind and I'm not tolerating it. <laughs> I love to and, hear that. 
yeah, yeah. And it's been cool because because this person has recently tried to contact me again, and I'm just like, nope. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. I, if there's one thing that I want people to remember is that your your well being is is your own responsibility, and it's hard. But if you if you need to tell somebody to fuck off. Tell them to fuck off and don't look back. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it was, it got really bad. There is a complete emotional upheaval in my life. And, you know, it's it's very strange to be on the other side of it now and looking back and going like, I am so glad that that happened. <laughs> yeah. I I have similar stories in my past where, like, I let things happen to me for too long. And then, Mm -hmm. but now looking back, I'm actually really grateful for those experiences. Not that I went through them, but what I learned from them and have been able to apply currently so that I no longer, or I'm never in danger of doing that to myself or having somebody else do things to me again. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in, I've been in parts counseling for like, two years now and you know currently the battle is there's a part of me that wants to believe that this person is good and you know there's there's this but the consensus with the majority of the parts aside from that one little piece of me that that wants to hold out hope that people are always good um there's the parts that are like i'm sorry but the evidence is overwhelming (laughs) that this is not good um I was, I actually did end up in a suicidal depression while I was, you know, with this, not with this person, but under this person's influence. And, you know, that was, that was rough. I was, I was learning about, you know, my PTSD and how that affects my life. I was learning how to live with anxiety and depression. And, uh, I, I remember getting to the point where I was just like, I don't, think that I want to live anymore and that was very (laughs) eye-opening it was very very hard um but you know I it's one of those things where where cutting start that's when I started cutting that person out (laughs) of my life was just saying you know what if this is how I am while under their influence I need to wean myself off of this. Like my, my self-preservation started kicking in. I'm like, we're not done yet. (laughs) And yeah. And so it, it caused like a major evaluation and a major release of, you know, things, things that were toxic. And, um, I found it, you know, very overwhelming emotionally. And I'm really grateful that I had my counselor to help me work through that. Um, and that was also around the time that I adopted Leo, who is an awesome emotional support cat. <laughs> um, but, but yeah. And then, and then when the final straw finally came and I was like, I cannot have this person in my life, period. Um, it was a very big move for myself and you know, the nice thing is I look back and I thank them for the lessons that I learned. Um, but I have come to the understanding that, that being appreciative of those lessons learned does not mean that they are welcome back in life. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, cause I always, I, I've been struggling with that a little bit lately cause it was like, well, you know, I appreciate that I have this sense of empowerment and this, you know, total boss bitch energy. <laughs> Um, and I'm, you know, I appreciate that this, this really did fuel and set me up for this coming into 2020 with, with things blossoming and flourishing. Um, but I don't have to like, (laughs) it's, it's one of those things like, you know, when you forgive somebody, you're not saying that what they did was okay. You're just saying you don't want to hang on to it. (laughs) And so it's the same thing. You can, you can be thankful for the lessons you learned in a really, really tough situation because those lessons are what's going to propel you forward, but you you don't need to have that situation in your life. (laughs) Yes. Oh, that's advice to live by for sure. Yeah. (laughs) So we're we're boss bitches in 2020. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes, we are. 
So you, in your intake form, you talked about how you are a mermaid in a bigger body. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about how, I, I guess, how that's looked for you or any kinds of mental obstacles you had to overcome about your physical body um, as being a mermaid? Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. <laughs> like, there are bigger mermaids. There is actually a society of fat mermaids run by Shea Monique and she is, she is a plus size diva and I love her to bits. <laughs> and you know, there's this, there's this nice movement within the mermaid community of, you know, reminding everybody that this is an inclusive hobby or profession or whatever. Um, for me, I've, I've never really seen myself as a performer. I don't do a lot of performance gigs. And my mental obstacle with that is it's like, well, yeah, you're not a size two. <laughs> you know, you're not a size two. You're not blonde. Um, you know, and, and so there was a lot of things that I wasn't that I had to sort of like push, not, not quite push, but learn to, d to deal with that mentality. Um, cause if you, like, if you see me standing next to my performing sisters in, in Circus Siren, like I'm one of the bigger girls <laughs> for sure. And it's, in you know, it, it's, it's weird because, you know, when you're in your, your mermaid tail and your top and everything, so much of your body is exposed. <laughs> like you have to, you have to become very comfortable with the, you know, reality that when you bend this way, you're going to have a role, whether you're, you're a big girl or a little girl. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's all about owning it and, you know, embracing your, your physical body in its entirety. Cause you know, my physical body has allowed me to, you know, hold my breath for two minutes and travel the world and keep up with whale sharks which is actually really hard <laughs> uh, I'd imagine <laughs> <laughs> like people don't realize they move freaking fast <laughs> and you know like for, for my job now I'm, I'm a, a snuba instructor on the weekends for one of the boats out here and so I'm lifting you know a 50 pound tank and carrying 20 extra pounds of weight up and down steps and you know, hauling these tanks on and off the boat. And it's like, you know, your body, even if it might not reflect fitness or beauty standards, is still strong. And that's that's probably the biggest thing that mermaiding is, has led me to appreciate is that even though I'm, you know, a bigger girl and that may turn people off from booking me for, like, corporate gigs and things because they are going for a very specific aesthetic, it doesn't mean I'm not a good mermaid, <laughs> right? It's it's just that, you know, they need something different. I offer something that, that they don't need right now. Um, and honestly, I enjoy being able to be in the water as an instructor a lot more than, <laughs> than um, you know, trying to find performances as a means for my business. <laughs> yeah. Do you still uh, struggle with that mentality of not being enough or have you gotten to a place where most of the time you're completely secure as a mermaid and as yourself? Like, what does that look like for you now? I, you know, that it really varies from day by day because <laughs> I think, I think now there's a much stronger underlying reality of, of my self-worth and you know I I value myself and that value isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon um but imposter syndrome is very real <laughs> oh yeah yeah and so you know just even just yesterday I was like sitting in in the office on the verge of tears just thinking to myself like I'm I can't do this <laughs> Aww. Or, or like I've made this all up. I'm a fraud. <laughs> I've been there many times. <laughs> yeah. Who am yeah, I to do it, this? <laughs> yes, and it it never goes away. <laughs> it really doesn't, and it's it's one of those things. I'm not sure. You know, I I hear more about my my sisters in life dealing with imposter syndrome than my brothers. Um, but. Yeah, like I have my days where where I I'm getting really hard and down on my body and 
you know, I, I don't feel comfortable in my own skin. Like those, those days still happen. Um, and you know, it's, it's an ongoing process. And that's the thing that I have to remind myself when I get into that headspace is that this, you know, I'm not a final product. <laughs> I'm a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. That's and, important to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the more that I kind of embrace that and allow myself to, you know, just enjoy existing, um, the, the less stress there is regarding, you know, my body shape or if I look good or do it, does the stress make me look bad? Like, it's just like, I'm just going to exist and be me and be authentic in myself. Mm, um, yes. And if that's a problem with other people, that's their problem. Yeah. So what, what would you tell others who feel insecure about their own bodies? You know, I would tell them that I I wish if there's one thing that I wish I did differently in life, and I don't have many regrets. And this this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, <laughs> is that I wish I didn't spend so much time worrying about it. Like life's short. <laughs> we get you know we get eighty years if we're lucky, which is not a lot of time to pursue our goals and live life as ourselves you know because when we're a kid we're, we're learning about everybody's expectations of us and then when we finally go to school we're still holding on to those expectations and at some point we have to let those expectations of what others want for us and this is society this is family this is friends you know we have to let that go we have to unlearn it and you know embrace what we are yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. I like, I, I think back to myself in high school and how I was always, you know, obsessing over like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm overweight. I can't wear, you know, bikinis <laughs> and, you know, I have to have a t-shirt on all the time. I can't wear any other like nice clothes. And it's like, you know, I, I just hit a, I like, I'm now looking back on that going, I wish I didn't spend so much time worrying about that. I wish I wore the bikini. (laughs) I wish I, I, you know, was able to unlearn this sooner because once you unlearn it and let that go, then your life begins. Yes. I feel that in my journey as well, like I wear mom jeans all the time now because I love having jeans that go up above my belly button. But for so many years, I was like, I don't have the right body type. I'll just look like a mom. I won't look like a a hipster cool guy I don't I don't know whatever stories I was telling myself but it's like wear what you love do what you love like (laughs) yeah yeah like I I honestly and this this is something that, that I've sort of been embracing with myself is I admire drag queens so much oh me too like I admire them for so many reasons I love I love their you know, I love their ability to read people. <laughs> I've been I've been binging RuPaul's Drag Race for a co- couple of weeks now, and I am just like I'm impressed with their makeup skills. Like I want to learn how to do makeup from a drag queen because <laughs> it's performance makeup. I'll be able to use it. <laughs> yeah. Do you get to wear makeup underwater? Yes, and I love it. <laughs> you do. So I do. Is that that must be really interesting? I guess you just have to get a bunch of waterproof makeup. Is that all that it takes? mostly um so false eyelashes aren't really possible underwater so don't (laughs) just don't (laughs) um but yeah one of the one of the things that I really have enjoyed doing is is experimenting with what works and what doesn't work um so typically I'll, I'll do like a waterproof foundation um and then like uh creams so cream eyeshadow as your base because it'll help any loose mineral pigment stick (laughs) and you know you're gonna have to expect to reapply (laughs) but I have done you know gigs that last a couple hours and my makeup is still there by the end of it it's a little faded but it's still there um but yeah I I do really enjoy playing with makeup when I get to perform that's probably my favorite part of performing is getting all done up um instructing I I don't 
wear makeup too often. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that. It's, yeah, it's like I have I have a snorkel mask on when I'm instructing because I have to see what everybody is doing. I'm like, yeah, it's just gonna peel all the foundation off my face. We're not even gonna waste it. <laughs> um, makeup's expensive. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure the the waterproof underwater makeup is probably more expensive as well. Yeah, I just got a little thing of Mac. Oh gosh, I'll have to look up what it's what it's called, but it's like a waterproof foundation, and you really don't need a lot of it, which is one thing that I really like. Um, but yeah, this tiny itty bitty thing was like fifty bucks. Oh geez. And yeah, I remember when I was starting to get like professional gigs, and I had to buy you know makeup for it. I was like, well, here's like six hundred dollars. <laughs> And it, it cracks me up, too, because, like, the only time I, I wear makeup is when I'm performing or if it's, like, a costume party. Other than that, I I just, I don't. <laughs> I'm kind of the same way. I'm like, am I going to go, like, out on the town? Yes? Okay, we'll put makeup on then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for me, like, it, it's funny because I I can do, like, normal makeup. But it, doing normal makeup is much harder for me than doing show makeup. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have to, like, mute it. You kind of take it yeah. down if you not just. Yeah. Like, I remember performing in Color Guard, and we were talking about how the instructors wanted the eyeshadow. And she was like, you basically need to look like a clown whore. <laughs> oh, my God. And so, <laughs> and I was just, like, it was the funniest thing. But it made sense because you have to, like, and with underwater, the challenge, too, is that your, your warm colors are going to fade. So you lose you lose your reds and oranges in the first 10 feet of the water column. So even if you're performing in a tank, like, you have to make sure that your reds are, like, super, super on point and brighter than you think you need it. <laughs> because everything is going to be cooled down underwater. Uh, I never thought about that. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And, you know, I know that because that's something we learned in marine biology. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> it all comes together. It all ties together. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, we're, yeah. we're kind of drawing to the end of our time. Is there anything you would like to leave our audience with today that you haven't already left them with? Don't take any shit. I'll reiterate. <laughs> <laughs> like, it it legitimately it, i i really want people to embrace themselves in their entirety um, cuz you know loving loving your physical body is is one aspect of of loving yourself right um we also need to you know take care of our our mental self we have to take care of our emotional self and our spiritual self too and however that looks for you do it <laughs> And don't let anyone tell you that you can't <laughs> or shouldn't. <laughs> and yeah, if you want to be extra, be extra. <laughs> I really love that advice, Lila. Thank you for sharing. Is there a place that um, that people can go to learn more about your mermaid retreats? Yes. So you can go to mermaiddreamretreats.com. And I post about Maui experiences conventions that I'll be attending and <laughs> um, any type of speaking events or anything like that. Um, and you can learn about the international retreats as well as the Maui experiences that we have. I'm actually super stoked that we just started doing partnering with a, a boat out here to get out to Molokini Crater, the mermaids at Molokini. And we're the first company to offer that. So yay. <laughs> cool. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. Oh, it sure has. <laughs> <laughs> How much body positivity is too much body positivity? I personally can never get enough of it. If you're like me and you find yourself seeking out more opportunities to surround yourself with media that affirms that you are normal or worthy of love or even just a reminder that you deserve happiness, I invite you to add the Little Cuties coloring book to your collection of body positive influences. 
With 50 original little cuties and six create your own templates, the Little Cuties Coloring Book aims to showcase different body and mental health experiences and give them the representation that we lack in the mainstream media. If this sounds like the kind of thing you'd like to add to your bookshelf or spend time coloring while you relax, please email us at bodystorypodcast at gmail.com to place your order. It's my goal to fund the Body Story Podcast by selling my own original artwork so I don't have to have podcast sponsors nor exploit the personal stories of my guests. So the books are $25 with free domestic shipping, and I'm working to get my website up and running to make purchasing easier. But for now, you can inquire at bodystorypodcast at gmail.com to place your order. If you'd like to take a peek at what these little cuties look like before committing to a whole coloring book, you can see all the book characters and more at Body Story Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.